um, one of the things that I do to recharge my brain and get my zen is uh, doing hiking or climbing on a regular basis. And this is a, a, a hike that's very close to where I live. And it's a really, really hard trail. It goes up and up and up for nearly two miles. And when I see this A8 marker, I'm like so relieved because I feel like I've tackled like one hardest part of the se section of the trail. And I feel like if I got to A8, yeah, I can pull myself up and finish up to A11. So this uh, trail is actually dedicated for the firefighters of 9-11. And a lot of firefighters actually use this trail uh, to build their endurance. I've actually seen firefighters wear all their gears in like 90 degrees Fahrenheit heat, and they're wearing like all their uniform and having all their equipment and just like hiking up, and I look at them in awe. <laughs> um, so the, the, these are some of the hikes in Southern California, and the, there's some similarities to these hikes. They all are high altitude, and uh, they're all hard. <laughs> and, but the thing is, these hikes uh, have, uh, the common parts are it's hard, it's high altitude, but they have different constraints. The one in the middle is uh, called the Devil's Backbone Trail, and it's all the way to Mount Baldy. And it's a razor thin trail. And in winter, people have died trying to hike up that mountain. And you're in high altitude, that is the ridge that you're walking on. And so that's the constraint for that hike. It's high and exposed. And on the other hand, you have Mount Whitney. Um, to even try to hike Mount Whitney, first you have to win the lottery. So you have to enter your name into the lottery system and hope you get picked. And of like, I think um, the 30,000 people that try to go to the top of Mount Whitney each year, only a third of them succeed. So one, like while I'm trying, standing here and telling you how hard these hikes are, can you imagine the person that actually had to do all the planning and do the execution of building this trail? So today I wanna ask you, how many of you here are trying to modernize your systems today? To me, you are that person trying to find a path where there is no path and you're trying to figure out where do I start, how do I go? And, and so this is a, a really, really hard task and you are doing the hard job. So every, in my, in my opinion, every modernization project is different, although it might share some of the uh, constraints. So you might be able to take some of the challenges and lessons learned from your other modernization projects, but every landscape is different. Are you trying to modernize a legacy system that's perhaps running on a Unisys or a IBM mainframe? Or are you trying to modernize a system that's like perhaps like six to seven years old? So are there people who know the code still around to help you? Or are people in, you know, right now retiring and there's like nobody to speak to? So these are some of the, um, the challenges that we have to think about in the landscape and the different needs of the business that's important. So today I'm going to talk about some of my experiences. I'm Indu Alagar Sami. I'm a principal engineer. I work at the Times. And at the Times, our mission is to seek the truth and help people understand the world. So to do this, we produce award-winning journalism and a spectrum of digital products to help people live informed and fulfilling lives. All of this helps our readers understand the complexity that is the human experience, be it from everyday recipes or breaking news alerts. So one such system that brings all of these experiences together is commerce. The system of commerce is massive and huge, and this is the area that I work in. And so 
here in commerce, what we are dealing with is like all of the subscription stuff. Uh, people still get newspapers delivered to their homes. So the home delivery business, we have our digital business, and also we have our corporate uh, business, like universities who wants to provide um, their students uh, subscriptions. So we're dealing with a lot of things like from payments and bookkeeping and finance and all of this is the world of commerce. But um, our users don't really care how our systems are built. Are they running on containers? Are they running on serverless technologies? They care about, hey, did I get my paper? Can I play Wordle? That's, that's, <laughs> that's their important concern. Now, behind the scenes, it is like our job as architects and leads to think about all of these complexities and how do we bridge these complexities so we can give this meaningful experience to our users. Um, so we are also on a modernization journey. We are trying to reduce complexity in our subscription business. And we um, are at the moment trying to intricately uh, um, move our corporate, like our B2B line of business from the monolith. And we are trying to get that part modernized so we can grow that side of our business. So um, in our case, right, so when, when we are thinking about like this, there are architectural patterns like strangler fig, but like where do you even start? And in our case, our system is decades old. That's decades with an S. So <laughs> you, can, you can understand the complexity, uh, complexity involved. So one, one of the first things is like we need to understand like our business strategy. And this is where Wadley mapping comes into play. This was created by Simon Wadley. It's a useful framework for understanding um, like the business needs or trying to at least understand why does our business exist today? What needs are our business trying to solve for our users? So this is a, a really good framework. And Simon Wadley has made all of his work public, so you can um, get, get his book online. And there's learnwadleymapping.com. There's a lot of great work done by Ben Mosier uh, that's also available. So we did Wadley mapping. And one of the fundamental things is about Wadley mapping, uh, about any business really, is everything evolves or it dies. So in our case, um, it's it's not. It's the the thing is that legacy and these systems exist and they're bringing value to our business. And it's we didn't do like when we built our systems. Um, there was no SaaS, nothing existed. So we had to build everything on our own. And just because it's legacy doesn't mean it's a bad word. It's bringing value to the business. It's bringing revenue to the business. So we always have to keep that in mind. Now, at one point, we were all pretty happy with the, um, the, the physical paper aspect. That's how people read news. They went and bought newspapers. But that sort of changed uh, towards the early 2000s when like, things like iPhone and, and smartphones got released. How people started to experience journalism changed. So we had to um, build our systems. Our systems needed to change. And if we don't do these changes fast enough, we're going to go out of business. So a lot of the times, uh, that meant like in order to go fast, you prob they probably built newer systems. In some of the cases, yes, we know this capability exists in the monolith, but it's just better if we just do this because we can go fast. And now there's complexity and duplicity. So this is, this is sort of like how things sort of grow and, and grow and grow. And this adds to more complexity, and the more complexity sort of now starts to bleed into the user experience. And, and that's when, like, um, so 
bridging, I, I think it was Chris who went on Twitter and said like, I am trying to change from home delivery to digital and why is this so hard? Why did I have to call customer care? Why did I have to get on the phone? Well, that's because, you know, this is one of the instances where like because of the complexity of the system, like the user was impacted. So one of those things that bridged the complexity maybe didn't work quite well that day and the user was impacted. So we, we don't, this is again like what Eric and um, Domain Driven Design teaches us, like we have to, if, if our goal is to try to build software that aligns with the business goals, it's not like a five-step modernization journey. If we don't keep changing our models and events and schemas and all the time, as soon as we, let's say we uh, deployed something to production and our mental model of what the business wanted was a certain way, and we released it. But then we learned that that's quite how uh, it's not quite how that works, and they're calling it something slightly different. But now that means um, you have to go back and change your schema of the events. You might have called your event uh, customer created. We don't create customers. Perhaps, uh, you know, business thinks of it as uh, subscribers signed in. And so now you've learned that. What do you do with that knowledge? And so if you don't go in and change those models, now you, your system is now slowly drifting apart from the language of the business. So as you notice these things, if we are able to correct them, we, are, like, we don't have to be in this modernization business. We're constantly trying to evolve, uh, be lockstep with our business needs. So, what, so what we did was we used Wadley mapping and we took our user, which is the subscriber, and one of their needs is I want to have my newspaper delivered to my house. So Wadley mapping starts with the user, user needs, you build a value chain. So we ask ourselves what in our business or system or ecosystem, what components do we have that fulfills this user need? And so one of this component is delivery fulfillment and what are the dependencies it has. So you just go down this value chain and you build the value chain. Now, you take this capability and ask yourselves, which stage of the Wadley mapping does this belong to? Is it in stage one? Is this uh, something surprising and exciting that nobody else is doing in the market? Or um, is something that's giving you a competitive edge in the market? Or this is something that's around in the market. This is not something new. It's a lot of people seem to have it. Or it could be a commodity that you can just rent. So you ask yourself, like this capability, where does this fall? Now, if this falls under either the first or the second, this is something where you should spend your resources and try to remodel or build your own custom secret sauce. But if this capability is so ubiquitous and common, um, then you're better off looking for something that's available in the market and see how you could integrate with that. So this sort of like helps you in your modernization journey. Where should I spend my resources? What should I actually build versus just go with something in the market? This is a good framework that we used uh, to help us with that decision. Now, we've understood so we broke this down, We've, we know who our users are, our users' needs are. Now we have to figure out how do we fulfill those user needs today in the existing system. If you don't understand that, how can you build a transition architecture to go where you need to be? So Service Blueprints is a, a technique uh, that shows and visualizes the relationship between the user journey elements and as well as like what services and components do we have that fulfill this journey. Um, I like Chris's definition. Uh, he said it's a diagram that shows the interactions between the user and the architectural elements. It's a much simpler definition. Um, so before Service Blueprints, uh, when, when I had to understand the 
the domain of home delivery. Um, it was through reading docs and meetings and talking to people, and it was hard. And I even tried big picture event storming, and that didn't go well for me. That does not mean it won't go well for you. But I had a hard time getting my business people thinking in terms of events and parse terms and commands, and that was like, that's too techy. Um, but so it was, it was hard. And so one of my colleagues, uh, design colleagues, we have a design team, uh, not just UX, but they actually research into uh, how can we make our user experience better. So it's a lot, it's a lot more than just traditional just user experience. And so my colleague, Olivia, she suggested, hey, can we try service blueprints? It's like, hey, well, let's, let's do it. Let's try it. So um, a service blueprint is, um, sorry. Yeah, so, so, so when we try to map the service blueprint, we, we take, like, what's the user journey? So in our case, there's a user who reads the paper, wants to click subscribe. What is the next step? They enter the delivery address, they give in the credit card information, and then they choose to subscribe. So the, that's the user actions, and that goes left to right. Then we have the front stage. In the front stage, we talk about what in each step of this journey, what is the user touching, seeing? How are they interacting with our system? And so that's the front stage. And then for each of the user action, the backstage is like, what happens behind the scenes? So when the user clicks, I want to see all the offers for the zip code, what happens? Well, there's probably an offer service, and that offer service might be talking to a legacy system. Um, in our case, we have a digital system and a home delivery system. So, so what are all these dependencies? What, what does this component depend on? And this is just for this one step. So now you can do the same thing, what happens at every step of the journey. So then you end up with the service blueprint, which gives you like what are all the components that are involved in this journey? And then you can reason about what's like what are the architectural problems? Perhaps, you know, this service is developed by a different team and they might have optimized certain things a different way. But then when you start looking at the interactions, perhaps the interactions is where the problems are and that's what needed the optimization, not how well the service did this one thing. So you might uncover uh, things of, of this nature, uh, perhaps even some temporal coupling. Uh, so as an architect, you can use this to figure out, is this interaction uh, going the way it should or what improvements can we make? Now that is for an architect. Now, for a person that's looking at the user experience, we can go, hey, uh, why is the zip code and when you're entering the address disabled? That's not very nice. Like, we should change that user experience. So they can focus on how can I change this user experience? Now, for someone who's in the project team, right? So we want to make a change. And then you look at it, and now you look at these architectural elements, you can actually color code them. Uh, what if this one thing was green, green meant uh, a different team, the other one was blue, that is a different team. So now you know as a project manager, like what are these team level dependencies that we have to solve for in order to actually make this one change? Perhaps if they belong to a different, um, completely different, um, team who have their own metrics and goals to hit for, you need to let them know ahead of time so they can get it into their roadmap. You can't just bring that up and say, hey, I need, I need you to do this. So it exposes all of these things. So um, we, this is, this is my evolved version of the service blueprint. Uh, I've been evolving it for at least a year and a half, too. So it looks much nicer, but it's the same thing. One of the thing is like a service blueprint has a scope. So why, like wh what, what is this service blueprint showing, illustrating? And this is where 
you need to be as specific as possible. This is for this 90% case. Your goal is not to map every single branch of the thing, of the user journey that, you know, oh, in this scenario, this happens. So if you try to map that, then it will become complex and it will lose its meaning. So you, you, could, you could make that more granular by picking the, the scope. And um, the legend, this was really, really useful for me. This is where I color coded the teams, and it's, it clearly indicates, like, you know, how many teams are we talking about here, and uh, what's the thing that's changing, and, and what are the third party components uh, that we're having to deal with. So the color coding really, really helped. Um, the front stage, this is, we talked about the front stage. This, so I combined the front stage and the uh, the user actions together to make it more meaningful or simpler. Um, and the backstage, this is where all of the components um, here. You can think about it as a, a catalog of services and components or like the dependencies. Your goal here is not mapping the actual sequence of how these things get called. The, the goal is this is just a catalog of what services and components are involved. This is not your one and only diagram that is going to describe your architecture. So you can use this, and then you can also go one level deeper and have sequence diagrams that go at a much, much deeper level to show the interactions. Perhaps like just that one vertical of how we get offers, you could build a sequence diagram which shows like what APIs are being used and so on. So think of this as like, what are the different components and what dependencies these components have in the backstage? And I created a third swim lane for alternate scenarios. This is where I wanted a way to have like, okay, yes, I do want to at least call out uh, alternate scenarios happen, and how do I do this? And, and so I figured, the alternate scenarios are going to happen at some step of the journey. So I just created a visual uh, indication, like which part of the journey you could branch into and just call out what those possibilities are. Now, in some cases, those might be very interesting. And in that case, you might want to build a dedicated service blueprint for that. Um, so this is great. Uh, you know, we we have users and uh, user needs, and we've figured out like what problems are. I mean, what parts of the journey are problematic? So, what do we? How do we? Um, how do we do this? And so, this is where you know we have. We could have different opinions. People could have strong opinions. Different opinions and strong opinions are kind of hard. And so we needed a way uh, to move forward with our decision-making process. And of course, you can have the very traditional meeting approach that goes nowhere. Or you could have a, a structured and repeatable and a systematic approach of how you look at problems. So one of the methods that we used is the double diamond method. It was designed by the British uh, Design Council, so this has been around. Again, this comes from the realm of service design and design field. And so in the double diamond, um, there's the problem space and there's a solution space. And we as DDDers understand problem space and solution space. So, the, so sometimes what we tend to do is even before we discover, understand the problem, we already have like solutions in our mind, like, hey, I want to solve it like this, or I want to solve it like this. And that's where like all of the strong, different opinions are coming from, because those are solutions. So you need to kind of like drag people back into the problem space and, and figure out like, hey, how can we understand more about this problem? What are some of the things that we can do? So the diamonds are like, uh, it's a diamond because the first diamond, the problem space, you first diverge. You, in the divergent part, you're trying, your goal is to try to look at the problem from different angles and areas and, and collect information. 
And then the second part is you converge. You've, you've learned a lot about this problem. You've looked at these attributes. And, and so now you can say, hey, like, let's bring this down. Let, like, we can now have a clear definition of what this problem is. And perhaps you know, by doing that, you might have identified maybe three ways of how you think about solving this. Now, once you have these three ways or uh, distilled down ways. Now, the solution space, again, you diverge. You take each solution and you, you see how it performs. And so now you've, you've done like your divergence and you've looked at how like all these three solutions perform in, in this sort of area. And then you can converge, you can look at, okay, was this, how is this better? How is this better? You could build your trade-offs and see how they work, uh, which one's better, what, what's the advantage, and then you can arrive at the solution. So uh, we, used, we used this method uh, to bring alignment. So when we were trying to figure out how can we migrate all our subscribers from the old system to the new system, we had a lot of differing thoughts. Um, we have done Big Bang migration before, so it's not a new thing for us. But a lot of people felt like, Big Bang migration, are you crazy? No, we have to do it face migration. But then this is where like, the double diamond helped, because Big Bang migration or face migration are just two ways of solving your problem. And even if you think about face migrations, there are so many different ways in which you can do that. Where do you start? So that's where we had to pull back everybody in, into the problem space and discover like, how many different ways can we group our subscribers? Should we group them based on revenue? Should we group them based on how new they are or how old they are? So all these different attributes like, helped us like, you know, look, look at look at it differently and look at groupings differently. So we were able to um, then take, we distilled down to two ways of grouping subscribers, face migration, then there's the Big Bang migration, so that was the third way. And so we took each of those, um, what do you call it, like options, solution options, and then we put it through a series of tests. So we had service blueprints for um, a, a person subscribing to the newspaper and a person canceling, a person changing their address. Uh, when a person goes on vacation, you don't want like a large pile of newspapers piling by your front door, so they may want to suspend delivery. So we have like these fundamental uh, important user needs, and so we by looking at the service blueprint and looking at this option, we asked ourselves, what needs to change? Um, what are the problems? How can we solve it? And so we did this for all three methods. And then in the conversion phase, we looked at where the benefits uh, stood out. And then it was actually a really good discovery process for us. A lot of us thought like, um, how we distribute, how we, um, if we started with like a set of uh, people that lived in a small area, that might be like the safest way to test. A lot of people like, you know, before we went through this process, we were very bought in on that idea, including myself. But then when we actually did this, um, <laughs> fell apart, when we took this use case of like, what happens when the person changes their address? Well, you don't want to go and create this person back in the old system because the old system had this stuff. So, so that was like a, a very good exercise. And so the double diamond kind of like helped us, gave us a way in which we can sort of experiment this um, in a six week time span before we actually built code and went down that wrong path. So to do this well, you got to be a good facilitator. And, and this is where um, this Dan Young and Mike Rosinski, they're actually teaching a hands-on workshop in the other room. They have these um, design aspects. How do you frame this conversation? How do you set up a workshop that can actually help you facilitate effectively? How can you listen to voices of dissent? Because if you don't give 
the voice of dissent, and if you don't hear those people out, you're going to be excluding them, and they might have really strong reasons. So this is a way in which you could be inclusive and listening to everyone's concern, because ultimately, as a team, every individual uh, who has this very strong opinion is very passionate about solving this problem. So we just need to hear each other's concerns, and how can we do that in a very efficient and a convergent manner? I learned a lot from my Dan. And um, last thing is decision records. Um, when, you, when you are figuring out all of these decisions, it's a journey. And you have to, you, you, I think in this conference, you heard a lot about architecture decision records. I think of it as just decision records. You've, you've, made, this, um, you've made this important decision. Let's capture that. And so, again, I went through different iterations of documenting my decisions. And over a period of like two years, uh, my first version of the decision record was very verbose. And so I went through iterations, and people found it difficult. Is this adopted? Where is it? Um, is this even current? So there was a lot of questions. And then I read Andrew Harmel Law's uh, article, and then I took some of, some of what he had, and then I took some of the stuff from my design team. It's like your eye just grabs like, hey, what is the, the, the question that we're trying to solve? So even designing this in a, in a manner that's like easy to just understand and read, uh, that template came from my design team. So I kind of took the good bits of everything <laughs> and created a, a template. So we now use this template within our modernization process, be it to document even product decisions. When we're trying to modernize, uh, there's a question of like, hey, should, should we have this in scope for our MVP? For our um, um, B2B business, as we are trying to modernize, we have to hit our goals, and so what scope can we cut? And we figured out, like, as we were trying to move, like taking all of the existing credit card tokens from this old system, which was like really old, uh, as different uh, versions that has to work with the payment gateway and converting them was like a hard process. And maybe we don't need to tackle that right now because our B2B folks, large companies, don't pay by recurring credit cards. We have a different payment method, they, we have contracts set up with them and you know they pay differently. And so there was a very small number of users. And so we decided, okay, so we're gonna just talk to them and tell them, hey, um, you're just gonna have to use one of our other existing payment methods. So we created a decision record. And so when people come and ask, say, hey, why didn't you do this thing? Like, here you go. This captures the journey. So. The first part is like uh, talking about like what is the current status of this decision. So you could actually start with a draft where you're just like thinking about the problem, where you would fill in like what is the question you're trying to answer. Always have context. Where does this question apply to? In what context? Just a few lines, and then perhaps when you're starting on this, you're not actually. Um, you don't know what the recommended decision is yet, so that could be like your TBD. And, but you, know, you might be considering other options, so you might be filling in those sections. And you identify who are your impacted stakeholders, who do you need to consult with, who is accountable, so you might have those people. So you are just working through this. And, and so as you're working through this, you might consider like, the different solutions, and based on that, now you might say, hey, I think I have a proposed way of doing this, and we propose this as the solution because of all these uh, advantages, and uh, oh, by the way, even if we do this, here are the constraints that we have to keep in mind, and, and so you document that, and then you talk to your stakeholders, and, and uh, then it becomes adopted. So it's, it's a journey, and you're capturing the actual journey, and it's not just a, like a state change, right? So there's, a, there's the whole journey that gets documented. So, um, and of course, this is also a nice way, like 
like you don't have to go, oh, there was a fig jam board for this. Oh, there's like few meeting notes documents. So this also gives you like a, a nice way to look at all the uh, related things that were involved in making this decision. So what are my heuristics for modernizing systems? I always want to think about modernization in a user-centered way because our business exists for the sole reason of satisfying our user needs. And so how, when we modernize, how are we improving their lives, be it your internal users or external users? If your internal users are using this existing system and they have so much pain and you, are, you have successfully modernized by taking all that old tech and now you have containers and serverless, but they still have to deal with the existing pain, can we really call that modernization? So start with, start with your user needs, and you can use Wadley mapping as one way to figure out like, what is the strategy that you need to have, um, especially like, you know, where should you spend your resources? Money is limited. Like, where sh what parts should you need to uh, spend your resources uh, rebuilding versus just buying something from the market. Um, and understand really how your system impact your users before making changes. And that you can do by talking to your stakeholders and users. And so there are different ways of doing that. One is the stakeholder uh, user research that we did. And there's also other methods like stakeholder mapping, and uh, one workshop that we did was we ran a Q&A uh, questions and not answers, but assumptions workshop. So what questions do we have as a team for this modernization? And what assumptions are we making? And are those assumptions valid from a business point of view? And uh, perhaps some of these questions can be answered or already answered. Maybe we just need to find the right person who has these answers. So. Doing this kind of helped what were the important questions as a team we needed to ask and address. So, and once you talk to your stakeholders, it's a lot of information. And there's actually a structured way of synthesizing that information. And that also comes from the design research team, and it's called the ORID facilitation framework. Um, so we use that. So basically, you observe, uh, you know, you had all these interviews, what, what, what did you learn? And then you reflect on it and understand, like, what did I not understand? Let me go back and clarify. And then you interpret the, the results. And um, so one of the ways we did that was we recorded our stakeholder conversations. And uh, we had, like, each person, a different person, listen to a different stakeholder interview. So we're not bringing one person's bias in. So we kind of distributed that in understanding those elements. So the ORD framework uh, is, is a very good framework for that. And of course, like before you go, like to, in order to define your transition architecture, you do need to understand like where does your current, how are your user, user needs being, um, being fulfilled by the current system, so you can go from there to your uh, new architecture. And so for that, like I found service blueprints to be a very, very useful way. But of course, there are other methods. It's not the only tool in the box. I've also used value stream mapping. Value stream mapping is super useful when it is not all about like the user interface, but you're trying to understand a business process. So you can break the process into steps and each step has like you know or activity and each activity has like you know steps and you can measure how long does this take uh, for each of the process and how long does it take between these activities so you you can you can have a lot of understanding and even improve your business process uh, and of course, there's example mapping in order to understand like what are these edge cases. We have a user need, user scenario. What are the edge cases? And domain storytelling. I think there was a work workshop by Henning in this conference. Uh, that's a, another cool method of understanding your domain. And event storming. 
So event storming may not be the only way. There are all these other methods that you can use to understand the current state, the complexity of your current state. Um, and my favorite, first understand the problem before you pick your solution, where a double diamond can help you pull you back to the problem space first before even like going with the solution. And um, don't forget to document your, your journey. And you can do that using decision records. And this is the cool part. We have so many different ways of inspecting, looking at complexity. And sometimes, just playing with these, you might actually create your own way. So you can, you can maybe borrow some of this and some of that and come up with your own way. So blending your own is, is, a, is a cool technique. And it comes only by playing with all of the other stuff. And so, um, so these are some of, some of like my, um, my, my, my thoughts. Um, so I really want to wish you the best in your adventure. And I'll be around for any questions uh, that you might have. And uh, come find me. Thanks.